Hi, good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, welcome to the worship from Chinese American Bible Church. Uh, I will read to you Psalms 18, starting from verse 21, to start off our worship. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray. Oh Lord, oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together, Lord, in your name and, and bring us together to worship you. Yes, Lord, you are worthy our worship, Lord, and, and may our worship uh, be acceptable to you as we celebrate you because of who you are. Oh, Lord, you're the almighty God, not just in the cosmos that, that is far from us, but you are the Lord loving God that despite of our sinful nature you have redeemed us and that you are living in our hearts lord that you are here with us even in this very worship and lord yes there's power in 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 you and there's power in prayer because of you and there's power in our worship because of you we celebrate you exalt your name lord yes this is the day that you have made for us to worship you this is your day every day is your day and you are the day lord you are the light of the world. So bless us now as we continue our worship. Bless us, Father, with your word. With uh, fill us with the Holy Spirit that we can take and we can experience you in this worship. We thank you, Lord, in the victorious name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. I just want to give to you some announcements. Uh, the English cell group. Uh, is every Sunday uh, from 7.30 to 9 p.m. I invite all of you to join us. Uh, if, feel free to invite your friends and, and your family members. Uh, and uh, you all have to do is just go onto our website at cabcnj.com and it will, has, it will have a link on it and you just click on that link and you can join at that time. Uh, also to remind you that there's a lady cell group uh, this uh, May 2nd, this coming Saturday, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, next Saturday, May 2nd, from 9.15 a.m. to 11 a.m. So that is the ID in the Zoom uh, uh, room. So uh, it will also be a, a, an email that will be sent to you or, or text to you if you're in the ladies cell group. So uh, that will be the uh, a room to join in. And also, you know, um, being stewards of God, God gave us everything, uh, including our talents and our possessions. And it really belongs to him. And, it, and then we reciprocate, and, and not only reciprocate, but a pleasure to give God our offering so that we don't forget even in this pandemic time where we have to worship uh, at, uh, from home uh, because of the social distancing, uh, we don't forget about tithing before the Lord. So you could tithe through the CABC website as well. Uh, you can click on tithing there and then and you could follow the procedure and, and also to provide uh, that offering. And also join us in the prayer room. Prayer is the most essential part of Christian living. That connects us to God. It reminds us to be holy. It reminds us that, that we cannot do anything without God and that we rely on him, that we have to take time to praise him, give him thanks. So come to our prayer meeting. I encourage you all to do that. That will help the church to thrive. It help your life, your personal life to thrive in the Lord. So it starts at 730 each Tuesday night. And just click on the prayer meeting link and the cabcnj.com uh, website again. And uh, we welcome you to our prayer meeting. I'm going to read to you the Apostles' Creed to uh, continue our worship. And you could join me at your home. Uh, you see the screen there. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin, Mary. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. Hallelujah. He ascended to heaven. Praise God. And is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty God. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Okay. The scripture reading today is from Acts chapter 24 to 20, from verse 22 to 27. Acts chapter 24, verse 22 to 27. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias, the tribune, came da comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending his needs. Paul in prison. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speaking about faith in Christ Jesus, as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years have elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left. We now get the time to Reverend Russ for his sermon. Hello, everyone. This is uh, George sheltering in place here in my home. Thank you for the chance to be with you uh, by these electronic means. And thank God for the technology available to do such a thing. Uh, thank you, Elder Kin, for reading our text uh, this morning. Uh, I think it may have been cut off right at the end when it says that Felix left Paul in prison. Well, uh, there's a verse that's quoted often in the book of Ecclesiastes where uh, the writer says there's a time for joy, a time for sorrow. And he also says there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. And today I believe that as Christians and as a church, uh, this is no time for silence. For the church, for the individual Christian, for you, this is no time for us to withdraw, uh, to be silent, uh, for two, two, two big reasons. Uh, one, the church has always been at its best in times like this. Uh, in past history, during times of plagues and pestilence and pandemics, uh, the people of God have always uh, come out to care for, to minister, and to share uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But secondly, uh, it's no time to be silent because people are looking for answers. They're looking for comfort. They're looking for something. They're looking for hope. Uh, a professor of economics at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark uh, named Jeanette Benson uh, conducted an internet search for prayer in 75 countries around the world at the onset of this uh, pandemic. And she pointed out that the search intensity for prayer doubles for every 80,000 new registered cases of COVID-19. She says in March, just in March alone, I'm not sure if people are seeing me now, but I think I'm um, okay. <laughs> Let me know, uh, uh, Virgil, if I'm not coming through correctly. Uh, she says in March alone, uh, the search for prayer surged to its highest in five years, surpassing all other major events that seem to uh, raise the level of awareness for prayer. And that includes Christmas, and Easter, uh, and she warns us that these figures may even be 
underestimated because some who really are reaching out for prayer, like the elderly, uh, those who are most severely hit by COVID-19, might not be the most active people on the internet. So this is no time to be silent. It's time to speak, the time to be courageous, the time to lean into and not away from this moment and what God's doing in this uh, unprecedented time. Now, this text that we read today is a part of a long section in the book of Acts that eventually uh, brings Paul to Rome. Now, you might remember from either reading the book of Acts or other letters that he wrote, it was always Paul's intention to get to Rome, and then on from there, perhaps, to go even as far uh, west as Spain. He wanted, obviously, to preach the gospel. He had no idea that he would get to Rome, not as a preacher, but as a prisoner. And he spent a considerable amount of time on his last missionary trip, collecting an offering for the poor saints who were suffering in Jerusalem. And this last section of the book of Acts is a long travel narrative, getting Paul from Asia Minor to Jerusalem. Uh, once he arrives in Jerusalem, he reports to the church leaders there. He undergoes a series of purification ceremonies to make him claim to enter the temple. And he is in worship in the temple when some of his previous enemies see him and they report him to the rulers and he gets to speak before them. After that speech, he is imprisoned and he is awaiting another appearance before the court when he receives word that there's a plot out uh, to kill him. He appeals to one of his guards, a commander, and that commander uh, takes him out of, Jer of Jerusalem by night with a letter for uh, the regional king, uh, Felix. He is accompanied by 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 soldiers with spears. Almost 500 people escorting Paul out of the city at night, and he carries with him a letter of explanation to Governor Felix. It's a two-day journey. They arrive in Caesarea. The governor reads the letter, places him under house arrest in Herod's palace, and he is awaiting the arrival of his accusers in Jerusalem to bring charges uh, against him. Now, these accusers, when they do arrive some five days later, uh, include the high priest of the temple, various other uh, religious uh, leaders, and their lawyer, a hired gun. The Alan Dershowitz of his day, his name is Tertullus, and they are going to present the case before Felix against the uh, Apostle Paul. So when you read these words here in verse 22, you can almost hear, you know, what we would associate with the beginning of a trial, like, all rise, the court is now in session. The case of the state versus Paul of Tarsus. Paul is brought in. He is placed in a section of the court called the dock. He needs to stand during the, during the, the, uh, the trial, and the prosecution's case begins. Tertullus stands before Governor Felix, and the first thing he tries to do is to uh, curry favor with the governor. He tries to capture any hint of benevolence that Felix may have by this constant unrest. And so in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 24, Virgil spends uh, a long time just trying to, to, to give this flowery kind of um, praise of Governor Felix's administration. He's been on, uh, in power for a long time. They've enjoyed a relative uh, season of peace. He is uh, trying to flatter Governor Felix. Uh, it was all 
um, untrue. Felix's tenure was marked by constant unrest. He was forced to call in the imperial power of Rome on several occasions. There's no records at all of any, any reforms that Felix uh, initiated. He was actually recalled to Rome later on because his administration was in a state of constant disarray. So it's quite nauseating to really know uh, what Tertullus is saying. It's all hot air. The charges are stated in verse 5. Verse 5 essentially says this, Paul is a troublemaker. The word that uh, is used here is the word pestilence or plague. Isn't that interesting? Tertullus is saying, Paul is a plague. He infects everyone with fear and incites them to riot against uh, the order. He is a viral plague. If you come in contact with Paul, you will be infected as well. He is a catalyst for chaos all over the world. That's the first charge. Paul is a, he is a troublemaker. The second thing that he says uh, in verse uh, five is that Paul is a ringleader. The word is even used right there on your screen. He is the ringleader of a sect of Nazarenes. That's what they used to call the early followers of Jesus. The implication here is that Paul is a rogue uh, minister. He is not mainstream. He's not part of the historic expression of Judaism. And he is not a part of the group that's actually paying Tertullus's fees right there in the court. In other words, Paul has gone, gone off, off map. Third thing that he says uh, in verse uh, six is that he is a desecrator of the temple, that he uh, has brought uh, a Gentile into the, into the temple courts. He's not followed temple procedure. And then in verse eight, he rests his case. He doesn't call for uh, the prosecution to uh, urge on Felix a guilty verdict. He actually opens the door for Paul himself to address the court. So it's not really a very stirring closing argument. So the governor, uh, in I think it's verse 9, uh, without any kind of a word, just motions, either with a nod of the head or uh, a gesture of the hand. In verse 10, you see it there for Paul uh, to speak his defense and uh, Paul does. Now, Paul is familiar with court procedure. He's been trained. He represents himself. He has no one there but himself to argue his case. His opening argument that he states in verse 10 is very respectful. He knows for many years you've been a judge over this nation, and he is now going to make his case. It's a neutral kind of acknowledgement that Festus has been in his position for a while, and then he, uh, he, then he begins to unpack his case. He says, uh, I agree. Twelve days ago, I was in Jerusalem. Everybody knows that. But as far as the charges are concerned, let me tell you this. And then he works through all three of the charges, refutes each one quite skillfully. And then as he's doing that, weaves into his defense a presentation of the gospel because there was no time for Paul to be silent about that. He says in verse 12, I'm not a troublemaker. There really is no charge uh, for, uh, no basis for the charges against. I, when they found me, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't disputing with anybody in the temple or even in the synagogues. I wasn't stirring up a crowd. And then in verse uh, 14, he addresses the fact that he's been accused of being a uh, the ringleader of a, of a sect. He does confess that he is a part of a group called the Way. Notice the capital W in the text, the Way. What he says is that the Way is not a rogue uh, breakaway movement. 
uh, that is undermining any kind of order in society and challenging Roman laws. He says, I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way to God. No one comes to the Father but by me or through me. Paul's previous life was in total opposition to the way. You might remember earlier in the book of Acts when Paul is on his way to Damascus. He is about to imprison Christians and to uh, uh, put them to death. He has in his hand a letter of authorization from the people in Jerusalem to go to Jerusalem and to persecute followers of the way. So now he confesses, I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way. Something has happened to me. My accusers say that for me to be a follower of the way is to turn my back on the God of our fathers. But what I say to you today is that in Jesus Christ is the focus of God's redemptive purposes in the world. And they find fulfillment in Jesus Christ, who is the way himself. I'm not part of a sect. I am a part uh, of the mainstream of God's redemptive purposes in the world that finds its fulfillment and completion in Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 14, he says, I uh, believe everything laid down by the law and the prophets. Everything said by the law and the prophets. In other words, everything that is said in our holy book points to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I share the same hope, he says in verse 15, uh, of all of these men. And I actually, uh, he brings his, these accusers into his defense. And he says then in verse 16, I am really here because of my belief in the resurrection. So he says in verse 16, I keep my conscience clear toward both God and man. That, that insertion of the word conscience is quite interesting. Tertullus, that hired lawyer, that flattering nonsense box, did not have any conscience. The other people who were there who brought these trumped up charges, they had no conscience either. And as we're going to see later, Felix, his life was messed up. He had no conscience. But Paul says, my conscience is clear. If I was to stand before the bar of God's judgment today, before this day is over, I know that not on account of something that I've done, not on anything that I have tried to accomplish, but because of what has been done for me in Jesus Christ, that the, the verdict before God for me would be not guilty. He answers the third charge in verses 17 and 18. He says, as far as a desecrator of the temple, uh, I didn't come to Jerusalem to cause trouble. I came to bring gifts. I came to bring an offering. There was no crowd with me. I was not involved in any disturbance. All of these accusations are unsubstantiated. I am not a troublemaker. I, am, I have been a good follower of the way. What I'm really on trial for is my belief that Jesus Christ is alive and he is well. So Paul steers the conversation. Paul is more concerned that Felix hears the gospel and becomes a Christian then he is released from prison. He is more concerned that Felix is declared not guilty in Jesus Christ than he is declared not guilty before Felix's court. Paul wants to see uncommitted people become followers of Jesus the way. So he speaks the very gospel to Felix. Well, Felix adjourns the case. Uh, this mock trial 
because he is waiting the arrival of a key witness. His name is Lysias or Lysias. He is the commander who wrote the letter when Paul was whisked out of Jerusalem about five days ago. And so Paul is ordered to be kept under house arrest, as a uh, uh, kept under guard, but with all the privileges of a citizen of Rome. He can receive friends and, uh, and things like that. Well, Felix is really uh, between a rock and a hard place. He knows that the charges are baseless and Paul should be released. But he's also seeking favor of the Jews, and it would not be popular for him to release Paul. <coughs> Excuse me. At the same time, he thought that Paul might have some extra cash from that offering and kind of use some of that to bribe him for, uh, for, a non, uh, for, for an acquittal. Uh, but he also seems interested in Paul's message. And so he gives Paul a private audience with himself and his wife to hear about faith in Christ Jesus. That comes out in verse 24. Perhaps he has an inkling. Yeah, there it is. He comes with his wife, and he wants to hear him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. He has an inkling that Paul is in a connection with someone that he had met. Paul has some kind of life-satisfying relationship, some kind of resource that allows him to be confident and calm um, and assured even before a court. Uh, so in public, Felix has this posture that he is an officer of the court, but in private, he is curious, he is confused, he is seeking, he's open, uh, he's interested. And I think that's true of everybody right now. Felix is playing a role, but in private, he has a troubled conscience. His heart is empty. His life is not satisfied. And when Felix mentions to his wife, Drusilla, about what happened that day in court, she is also interested. She wants to know more about Paul and his message. And so Felix brings Paul before him and his wife to have a private conversation over the course of the next two years. Now, Felix, his name means happy. Mr. Happy. He is on his third marriage. Drusilla is on her second. Now, Drusilla is related to Herod Agrippa I, the one who died in Acts chapter 12. She is also the sister of Agrippa II, who we will meet in another chapter. And according to some secular historians of the day, she was a young, ravishing beauty. Those are the words that are used. She is in her early 20s. Felix, uh, for, for him, Drusilla was just a prize. Felix used the skills of a magician to seduce Drusilla away from her first husband to become his third wife. It all sounds so contemporary. The paparazzi would be following Drusilla around because of her beauty everywhere she went. They would have been on the front pages of the National Enquirer, right? But as far as their personal relationship is concerned, psychologically, emotionally, and in every other way, their marriage is a royal mess. Underneath all of the trappings of being in power, their lives are a mess, and they stand in front of Paul. Now, compared to this royal couple, Paul is a short, bow-legged, bald-headed uh, man. He's just a clay pot, right? He is the one that should be under duress. Uh, he stands before apparent power. They have his life in his hands. Felix thinks he's in charge. 
And Paul, like the church, looks weak and impoverished. But this door of opportunity has swung open. And this door for listening in Felix and Drusilla has swung open. And Paul walks through it and preaches the gospel to this couple. Well, if that was me, maybe if it was you and you were under house arrest waiting for the verdict of the governor and the trial to resume with his wife there in front of you, uh, what would you say? You know, maybe you might want to make friends with the governor, try to get on his good side, maybe negotiate a private deal for your release, maybe go over the charges again. Uh, but that's not what Paul did. That is not what Paul did. Remember when Paul was saved on that Damascus road, that a believer in Damascus named Ananias was told by God these words, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings. And this is happening right now. Later on, Paul would write uh, to the Corinthians, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. He wasn't afraid of Felix. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. And he would say that we've been compelled by the love of Christ, and we no longer look on anybody from a human point of view to Paul. Felix was just a fellow human being, not the governor or some important person. And he said, we are ambassadors for Christ. So knowing the fear of the Lord, being constrained by the love of Christ, not taking into account Felix's stature as the governor of Caesarea, and knowing that he was an ambassador for Christ, Paul then goes and preaches the gospel. Uh, and, and this is what he says, the, Luke says. He discoursed, that's the word that's used uh, in verse 24. He discoursed about faith in Christ Jesus, the story of the gospel, the unfolding of God's plan and, uh, and history through Jesus Christ how a righteousness, how a right standing before the judge of the universe uh, is granted to us, how through the death and resurrection of Jesus, he took our sins and gave us his righteousness as a gift of the grace of God. And Paul urges on them to believe in Jesus. You see it there in verse uh, 25. He reasoned, he discoursed, he preached uh, about righteousness uh, to them. And then in verse 25, the results of righteousness, the results of receiving the gift of salvation, which is used here, the word self-control, holiness before God. Now, can you see this royal couple begin to fidget in their seats a little bit, looking at one another? Self-control? Their whole lives have been marked by unbridled passions. Maybe Paul talked to them about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, dot, 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 self-control. Maybe Paul told them about how in Jesus Christ he can bring all of their disorder, disordered loves and lusts under his jurisdiction to live within the liberty of the children of God. And then Paul caps it off in that same verse by speaking of the co coming judgment. <laughs> I wonder if he said it something like this. Hey, Mr. Happy, <laughs> Mr. Happy, I stood before you in your courtroom and I am waiting your decision about my case. But I want you to know that you, will stand one day before God at the bar of his justice. You will be in the dock, and he will decide your case. Mr. Happy, <laughs> it's time for you to get sad. Unlike the charges against me that are baseless, the charge against you is solid and strong and undeniable. This is why Jesus came to bear your sins, to take in himself your just punishment, securing your release and pardon. And I urge the two of you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. That was quite a private audience to preach that message to. 
it says in verse 25 that Felix was afraid and alarmed. And he said, that's enough. That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Verse 25. All that convenient time apparently never came. Two years passed, the text tells us, and then Felix was summoned to Rome and succeeded by Festus. That's there in verse 27. And his trial then before Festus and then Agrippa follows in chapter 26. We don't know what happened necessarily to Felix. We know what happened to his wife. Drusilla and her son in A.D. 79 died in Pompeii after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. You could just see both of them at a gala event on the front page of the uh, Pompeii Times, walking down red carpets with flash bulbs popping, crowds looking on, dance band playing, people dancing carefree when they hear outside the rumbling in the distance, the likes of which they had never heard before. And before Drusilla, her son, and the citizens of Pompeii go anywhere, they are smothered by toxic fumes and volcanic ash. And that convenient time was lost forever. Man, what a story here. Felix is like so many of us. Maybe you know some people like Felix. On the outside, a power couple. On the inside, a competing mess of disordered loves and desires. They've never crossed from death into life, and now they're trying to manage through this unprecedented time in our lives, and they're afraid. And they need to be wooed by the love of Jesus and then won by the love of Jesus. It's not time for us uh, to be silent. It's time for us to proclaim his presence, to proclaim his purpose, to demonstrate what it really looks like to be loved by Jesus. You know, sometimes these kinds of events we go through are really open doors, uh, open doors that bring us before other people we would never have the chance to speak with, open doors that uh, open people's hearts that are receptive now to the message of faith in Christ Jesus, the gift of righteousness, uh, the development of a godly character, and the assurance of pardon and no condemnation in the coming judgment. No time to be silent, friends. Take advantage of all the opportunities that he brings to you. Maybe we're neighbors walking past your house, uh, maybe clerks in the store, wherever it may be. Let's not be silent. Let's pray for that time of opportunity. Let's pray when people ask us the reason why we have such hope in Jesus Christ. We do it with gentleness and reverence and meekness, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to put into words and to put into deeds the message of the gospel in a time like this. Thank you for this text, and thank you for what you're teaching us in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yes. Thank God for the um, sermon that uh, Reverend Russ had provided us and uh, to speak God's word to us. Uh, we praise God for that. And um, I echo uh, what Reverend Russ just um, preached to us. And first, in First Peter, it says that uh, we need to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And we are prepared to share the gospel of Christ to all. And that's the purpose of why we're here on earth. Uh, we are Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's instrument of truth. So my brothers and sisters, um, be strong in the Lord and the gospel that, that he has so graciously provided us uh, to share and be salt and light of the world that others may know who Jesus is. Yes, indeed, he is risen and he has conquered death and he's worthy of our praise. He redeemed us. That's where eternal life and glory is in him. So, brothers and sisters, let me um, give you the benediction from uh, the same Psalms I read before towards the end. Let's receive his word. You are my God. I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Peace to you, brothers and sisters. May you go in peace and may the Lord bless you for the rest of the week as he gives you opportunity to be his witnesses. So bless you, my brothers and sisters, my fellow worshipers.